I think only half the, uh, the, the 12 billion arms shipped in the last year went into mobile phones. So that means six billion went somewhere else. A few have gone in Raspberry Pis, yes, but they're also in, you know, the, the DSL Wi-Fi base stations you have in your house. And Probably in this camera. They may, I don't know if they're in that <laughs> camera. Um, they're, they're, they're all over the place. At the time we embarked on the ARM design, there wasn't a single dominant microprocessor company in the way that on the desktop Intel is dominant today. And of course, in the mobile embedded, ARM is equally dominant. Um, but at that time, there were a number of companies and there was quite a lot of creativity in the microprocessor market. It seemed like there were more opportunities uh, for new companies. But really, at Acorn, we just wanted something that worked in our desktop machines. Um, we were designing a processor for Acorn's products. Um, and we went into this quite tentatively and, and, and very unsure that we'd come out with anything that ever got used. We had formed the firm view that the primary determinant of a computer's performance is, is, um, is the memory bandwidth you can access to the processor. Notionally, the 32016 has a, a nice instruction set and the 6502 has a primitive one, but if you looked at the performance you got, it just scaled with the bandwidth. The 16-bit microprocessors could not use the bandwidth that was available in the memory that people put in these machines. So you'd spent your money, you bought some bandwidth, and then you were coupling this to a processor that couldn't use that basic resource. And this just struck us as wrong. And we were wondering what to do about it. We were just sort of dithering, basically, when Herman dropped on our desks copies of some papers, from, particularly from Berkeley, but also from Stanford, that described a different sort of processor designed by student classes. This was, of course, RISC, Reduced Instruction Set Computing. The standard processors of the time were what was then called KISC, Complex Instruction Set Computers. They would have, you know, instruction sets similar to the digital VAX, which had you know, a single instruction for subroutine entry, which did all sorts of stuff, um, and didn't match that many languages. So lots of languages had to do subroutine call by a different means because the instruction wasn't just right. While the industry was moving one way, the risk idea was to go the other way. And Roger started sketching out risk-like instruction set designs. And, and the the real turning point was, that he was doing this during the summer of 83, the real turning point was about October 83 when um, the two of us went out to Phoenix, Arizona um, to look at a company that was building um, an evolution of the 6502 um, to give it to 24-bit address space instead of the 16-bit on the BBC Micro. This was the 65C816, I think. And we went to Phoenix expecting to find, you know, big American company with large shiny office block and lots of expensive equipment. And what we discovered was that this design work was going on in a bungalow in the suburbs. Um, and, and they were hiring VAC students to do cell design on Apple II computers and so on. And it, was, it really sort of felt more like a cottage industry than a, a big American enterprise. And, and so we came away from there thinking, well, if they can design a microprocessor, maybe we can. That was late 83. And as we set about designing the arm, um, we didn't really expect to pull it off. Okay? Firstly, we thought this risk idea is so obvious that big industry will pick up on it and we'll get trampled underfoot. Secondly, we still had this slight queasy feeling that microprocessor design was a black art and at some point we'd discover why this was a really bad idea to be doing ourselves. Roger had a very firm idea of what he wanted from an instruction set because he written all these basic interpreters and, uh, and, and knew about other high-level languages as well. Um, and uh, the, the interesting thing alongside this is that um, under, I think, Andy Hopper's influence, Herman had decided that in the future there were only going to be two sorts of computer companies, those that had learned to design on silicon and those that had gone bust. And so Acorn was going to be in the first category. So we'd gone, we'd looked around the world for tools for designing chips. We identified tools from VLSI technology in San Jose. We bought workstations, which then were very expensive, Apollo workstations for these tools to run on. And we'd gone out and hired chip designers. 
um, and we had a chip design group who didn't have much to do. Um, so this was a strategy that, that said we have to be able to do this, but hadn't quite worked out why yet. And so as we were sketching um, a microprocessor design, we had these chip designers who were ready just to take the ideas and map them onto silicon. Most of that work happened in 84. Uh, we taped out in January 85. Historically, you, you design the chip on a computer, so you build all the files you needed to make the chip on a computer, and then because this was a large data structure, you write it all onto a tape, and then you'd put the tape in the post to the fab. And shipping the tape is, is, is the crunch point, okay? Up to that point, you can change things. Once the tape's gone, it's gone. Uh, and so even today, we still talk about tape out, even though no physical tape is injured in the course of making chips anymore. Everything's done over the internet, but we still call it tape out when you finally push the button and say, we can't think of anything else to test, let's make it. But in 85, when we were doing this for the arm, at Acorn, we didn't have the tools to do the final checks on the design. So we took the design, probably on physical magnetic tape, to Munich, to VLSI Technologies offices, and used their equipment and their tools to do the final tests, and then said, go make it. And uh, it was a spectacularly cold winter. I remember walking around Munich, where most of the taxis were lying dead by the side of the road because their fuel had frozen in in the pipes, and this is diesel fuel, okay, in a taxi, so it was really cold, but that was the tape out. And then you go home and wait, um, and typically the processes take about three months. They have to make masks for doing the various layers, and at the end of it they produce wafers, which they then have to break up and package, and then they send you the package parts. Now, the thing you do in the three months, of course, is you build the circuit board, because when the chip arrives, you want to plug it in, see if it works, and crack the champagne. A tradition that's, I think, probably started a bit before the arm, but certainly if you go to arms offices in Cambridge, you'll find there's a wall with hundreds of champagne bottles up it. It's, uh, I'm sure Herman started this tradition at Acorn, and I do it here in Manchester as well, um, when we get a chip back. When it works, it has to work. It doesn't have to be tested very extensively, it just has to sit in a board and, and, and you know, play ball for a few seconds and then you open the champagne. I don't remember what program we used initially. It would probably be some very simple Hello World. But very quickly we got BBC Basic up. If it ran Basic, then it was pretty much working. Okay, the, uh, Basic would test most features of the chip. Was it a surprise? We expected to go into this project finding out why it wasn't a good idea to do it. And, and, the, and the obstacle just never emerged from the mist. We just kept moving forward through the fog until eventually we had a fully working arm chip in our hands. And, and um, you know, it did what we expected. It, it, uh, it gave about 25 times the performance of the BBC Micro, which is exactly what the memory bandwidth calculations predicted. Um, it worked, it was cheap, it was low power. I don't think it was day one, but a few days later we decided we'd better measure the power consumption. So I set up a circuit board with an ammeter in series with the power supply, um, just the power supply to the arm chip itself, uh, turned the arm chip in, uh, turned the arm chip on, ran some, ran some code on it, looked at the ammeter, and it was reading zero. And I knew we'd designed a fairly low power chip, but this was um, a bit remarkable. And it turned out that actually I'd, in, in inserting the ammeter into the power supply, I'd failed to connect the power supply. Um, so no current was flowing through the ammeter, but the chip was still running. Um, we had to think about this for a bit, because this isn't what usually happened. So, so hang on, so it wasn't just you didn't connect the ammeter, it was actually that you didn't connect the chip to the power supply, is Yes, that right? the, there was no power supply connection to the chip. And yet it was And yet it was running. <laughs> and um, what of course was happening when you thought about it, it was fairly clear, is there were external chips providing inputs and the inputs to a CMOS circuit have protection diodes, which basically are, are there to stop the input going outside the rails and, and burning transistors out. But in this case, what they were doing was feeding power from these input signals into the power supply and powering the whole chip. So, so effectively, we were powering the chip from the signal inputs. Um, and uh, we connected the ammeter properly and measured the power um, 
and indeed it was very low as it would have to be to be powered from the signal inputs but it was uh, finite. The low power properties of the arm are, uh, are a key to its longer term success. They were not actually crucial to ACORN's application. Our requirement was that this should go in a desktop machine, so there was a tethered power supply, but it should go in a plastic package because uh, plastic packages cost a few tens of cents and ceramic packages cost tens of dollars. Um, and to go in a plastic package you had to come in under a watt. A watt's about the limit. Uh, today it's probably about two watts. Um, but um, in order to get it under a watt we had to be careful with the engineering and the tools were not very accurate. So we, we effectively applied Victorian engineering margins to the power and it actually came in under a tenth of a watt. Um, later on that low power characteristic became one of the key selling features. Um, the low power is very closely related to the complexity of the design. I mean, ARM is an incredibly simple processor, at least it was in 1985. Um, some variants of the ARM are now not quite so simple, um, but it used 25,000 transistors. To what order of difference was that? I should know the number, but I'm afraid I don't remember. Um, but I do remember that ARM was, was fewer. And the small number of transistors meant there's less switching activity in every clock cycle and therefore less power. Um, so there was no magic to its low power characteristics apart from simplicity. So how does that feel then to know that you were part of the beginning of something so big? I mean I, I am staggered by the success of ARM. I mean the success of ARM very much underpins my reputation, okay, uh, which I f sometimes feel a bit guilty about because although I certainly played a, a role in sowing the seeds, you know, it's taken thousands of people um, a lot of effort since then and so, some of the time I think you know the three and three point three thousand people working for ARM are all just working to enhance my reputation but it is an effect of what they do um, which I don't feel is, 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 is fully earned these days it's 25 years since I Professor, it's very since, much earned. since since I left but um, it's uh, you know it, it, it's a great company and of course it, you know it's been there throughout my uh, subsequent professional career and, and all my research has had some kind of link to ARM. Um, so, um, Long may it live. Uh, absolutely, it's a, it's a great success and uh, if you know the person that runs ARM, you know, the CEO of ARM today, you'll see his master's thesis on my shelf up there. So. <laughs>